Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students and welcome to Swayam Prabha. I am Dr. Vageshwari Deswal, Professor of Law at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. The title of our course is Substantive Criminal Law. Today we will be discussing lesson number 9 which is titled Sexual Offenses. So students, today we will discuss the offence which is the worst crime against womanhood. Yes, I am talking about the crime of rape. Rape is the worst crime against womanhood. The offence of rape in its simplest term is the ravishment of a woman without her consent by force, fear or fraud. It is the most morally and physically reprehensible crime in a society as it is an assault on the body, mind and privacy of the victim. While a murderer destroys the physical frame of the victim, a rapist degrades and defiles the soul of a helpless female. A woman who is raped suffered not only a physical injury but a deep sense of some deathless shame. Even though time eventually heals the physical scars, but the mental scars, they never go. Rape was recognized as a crime under Section 375 of the Indian Penal Code in the year 1860, amended in the year 1983 and further amended in 2013. Sexual violence apart from being a dehumanizing act, is an unlawful intrusion on the right of privacy and sanctity of a woman. It is a serious blow to her supreme honor and offends her self-esteem and dignity as well. It degrades and humiliates the victim and where the victim is a helpless, innocent child or a minor it leaves behind a traumatic experience. A rapist not only causes physical injuries, but leaves behind a scar on the cherished position of a woman, that is, her dignity, honor, reputation and chastity. So students, let us talk about the development of laws relating to rape in our country. The laws relating to rape that we have now, they were not the same when they were initially introduced in the year 1860. We have to trace the history from 1860 till a major movement that was launched in the wake of uh, Mathura case, thereafter the Nirbhaya incident then the Kathwa and Unnao incident and finally now in 2023 how the rape laws they have been expanded. So we will start from Tukaram. Tukaram versus state of Maharashtra which is popularly known as the Mathura rape case. See Mathura was the name of the victim of rape but that time at that time it was not prohibited to disclose the name of the rape victim before the media and that is why everybody knows about Tukaram versus state of Maharashtra case as the Mathura case. It was only later on that our legislators were sensitized. Thereafter, we had several good judgments wherein the courts themselves emphasized on the sensitization of our judges as well. So let us talk about the Mathura case. In Tukaram versus state of Maharashtra, two constables 
were tried for raping a 16 year old tribal girl within the premises of a police station. The sessions court acquitted them and said that Mathura was a liar who was habituated to sexual intercourse as proven by her medical examination. They held that she had sex voluntarily with the police constables as there were no marks of any injury on her person from which it could be deduced that she had resisted or that the act was done without her consent. The High Court reversed the judgment and held that the sexual intercourse in question was forcible and amounted to rape. The High Court also remarked that the learned judges of the trial court had erred in making a distinction between consent and mere passive submission. When the accused went in appeal, the Supreme Court overruled the judgment of the High Court and agreed with the trial court and held that whatever happened was a consensual and a peaceful affair. Now this case was highly criticized by the media and all sections of the society held widespread demonstrations against the injustice that had been meted out to Mathura. Same year in September, eminent law teachers of the country wrote an open letter to the Chief Justice of India criticizing the judgment and asking the court to review its judgment. All this did lead eventually to amendments in the rape law in the year 1983 and now several categories of rape such as custodial rape, gang rape, rape of a pregnant woman etc. were introduced in the Indian Penal Code. See Mathura was raped inside a police station. And the reason why the accused were acquitted were absence of injury marks on her body. So as per the learned judges, it must have been a consensual and a peaceful affair. Whereas the high court judges had rightly remarked that the trial court could not make a distinction between an active consent and a mere meek passive submission. This was the reason why custodial rape was introduced as a category because what happens when a person has control over another woman and he induces her to have sex with him. Now the woman has consented because she has been compelled by that other person to say yes. So just because she has submitted that does not mean that she had consented to the act. Just because she has not resisted that cannot be construed to be a consent in itself. Here the woman could not resist because of the influence of the accused in whose custody she was. That is why the courts held, uh, that is why the legislators they brought about this amendment and held that in cases of custody when a woman is raped and the accused tries to take this plea that she see whatever happened was a peaceful affair and she did not resist. So then the consent which the woman has given under the influence of that person in whose custody she was held will not amount to a consent as to absolve the accused of his guilt. That is how we got this categorization of custodial rapes and then some other categories was also introduced. Then a provision section 114A relating to presumption as to absence of consent in prosecutions for rape was also inserted in the Indian Evidence Act. See usually what happens, rape happens in private when there are no witnesses. In such cases, if we doubt the testimony of the rape victim, so in a closed society like ours, doubting the testimony of a rape victim is like adding insult to injury. It takes great amount of courage for a woman to come out and admit that she has been raped. And then if we were to disbelieve her statement or insist on corroboration of her statement by independent witnesses, where will she get witnesses from if it had taken place in private? And then in such cases, if you allow the accused to be given the benefit of doubt, that would be detrimental to the victim's case. And that is why section 114A which created a presumption as to absence of consent that if a victim has complained and if the victim says that I did not consent 
the courts will presume that she had not consented and now the burden would be on the defense to displace this presumption. After this, in 2004, a writ petition under Article 32 of the Constitution was filed by way of PIL by an NGO Sakshi seeking the broadening of the term sexual intercourse contained in section 375 of the Indian Penal Code to include all forms of penetration. The Honorable Supreme Court refused to uh, grant what the NGO was seeking and rather they observed that judiciary cannot legislate in the garb of interpretation as it may violate the guarantee enshrined in Article 20 Clause 1 of the Constitution of India which says that no person shall be convicted of any offence except for violation of law in force at the time of the commission of the act charged as an offence nor be subjected to a penalty greater than that which might have been inflicted under the law in force at the time of the commission of the offence. So, the Supreme Court refused to intervene and broaden the ambit of the term sexual uh, intercourse to include all sorts of penetrative violations of a woman's anatomy. Thereafter, in December 2012, there was a case of brutal gang rape that shocked the entire nation. A 23-year-old paramedical student was gang raped inside a moving bus in national capital region of our country by six persons. The victim, whom media later on named as Nirbhaya, she was brutally assaulted, raped, sodomized and violated by the six accused. Her male friend, who accompanied her, was also brutally thrashed with iron rods. Finally, the two were stripped and thrown out of the moving bus. This happened in December, such cold winters in New Delhi and they were left to die on the roads. An FIR was registered and she was hospitalized. But the nature of injuries to her vital organs was so severe that both her intestines had to be removed. She was kept on life support systems and she finally succumbed to her injuries in a multi-organ transplant speciality hospital at Singapore where she had been flown for treatment. All the accused were arrested and tried. In March 2013, one of the accused, Ram Singh, was found dead in prison. In August 2013, another accused, allegedly the most brutal of all, who was a minor at the time of incident, was given three years of sentence in a reformatory. The trial court delivered its judgment against the remaining four in September the same year and convicted the remaining four accused under sections 302, 120B, 365, 366, 376, 2G and section 377 of the Indian Penal Code, they were all awarded the extreme penalty of death. See, had Nirbhaya not died, the maximum punishment prescribed for rape at that time was 7 years. It was because Nirbhaya succumbed to her injuries. So, what happened? That the charge, it was shifted from rape to murder. Now see the kind of brutality that was inflicted on Nirbhaya. What if she had not succumbed to her injuries? The accused could not have been awarded the death penalty. So the lawmakers realizing the gravity of the situation, they pushed for further amendments in the law. In the wake of the agitation that followed, the Home Ministry appointed a three-member committee headed by the former Chief Justice of India, Justice J.S. Verma to recommend amendments in criminal law for rape and other crimes against women. The committee submitted its report running into 630 pages on 23rd January 2013. In February, a criminal law ordinance prescribing death penalty for rapists and desexualizing the rape laws was enforced. See, why did the criminal law ordinance desexualize rape laws? Because already in the year 2012, we had got POCSO, which is Protection of Children Against Sexual Offences Act, 
which had replaced the term rape with sexual assault and it was a gender neutral legislation in which it was accepted that whether it is a boy or a girl both can be victims of rape and whether it is a man or a woman they both can be also accused for the offense of sexual assault but uh, when uh, this uh, but when uh, finally the criminal laws amendment bill 2013 was passed by the legislature and notified with effect from 2nd February to 2013 what happened we reverted back to the gender specific offense that rape earlier was this led to repeal of the ordinance now heavier punishments were prescribed for rapists several new categories of rape were introduced and the definition of rape was broadened to include all sorts of penetrative violations of the female's anatomy so a much needed change that activists lawyers academicians they were asking for all women's group were asking for these amendments to be brought about in the rape laws since sakshi case but finally in 2013 this happened thereafter in the year 2018 rape laws were made more stringent and heavier punishments were prescribed in cases of rape involving minors in 2023 now Bharatiya Nyay Sahita has retained the earlier provisions relating to rape but some new provisions such as sexual intercourse by employing deceitful means have been introduced and marital rape exemption to husband is available only in case the wife is above 18 years of age. In between, we also got several landmark judgments in which courts were sensitized. Judges remarked that judges should refrain from using any kind of a language that casts aspersions on the character of the rape victim because what would happen the defense would lead evidences they would produce witnesses to testify that the girl was already habituated to sexual intercourse or that maybe she was going around with many men or she was a victim or she was a person of a loose character so the courts remarked that in rape trials the judges must be sensitized because what happens in rape trials why you need to refrain from casting aspersions on the victim's character is because in a trial for rape who is on trial is the accused and not the rape victim so finally coming to the definition of the term rape now rape comes from a latin term rapio which means forcible seizure of a woman so rape is a crime which can be committed only against a woman so rape is a gender specific crime for minors we have poxo which is a gender neutral legislation and the term also that we use in poxo is sexual assault because sexual assault is again a gender neutral term but when we talk about the term rape rape is something is something which can be committed only against a woman so section 63 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita, it defines rape and there are four kinds of acts that have been given under clauses A, B, C and D of section 63. So section 63 says a man is said to commit rape if he, now these four acts as you can see on the screen, now these are four categories of sexual acts that have been broadly described. What it says is that all sorts of penetrative violations of a woman's any orifice of a woman's anatomy now that has been held punishable whether the man uses his male organ whether he uses fingers whether he uses sticks or whether he uses any other uh, uh, thing also because now digital rape has also been recognized as a kind of rape under the law but rape is a question of law what this means is even if any of the sexual acts they have been done against a woman but if it is a consensual affair even if the man and woman they have indulged in some kind of a brutal sex but if it is a consensual affair the law will not be invoked law comes into play only if it any of the sexual acts are done under the circumstances that fall under any of the descriptions that are given under the law what are the descriptions the act should have been done 
against her will. So any of the acts that have been given under clause A to D, it would amount to a rape if it is done against a woman's will. Now how do you construe a woman's will? Rape against the woman's will implies that it was committed despite stiff resistance and opposition from the woman. Mere passive or helpless surrender of the body and its resignation to the other's lust induced by threats or fear cannot be equated with the desire or will. Nor can it furnish an answer by the mere fact that sexual act was not in opposition to such desire or volition. So what is required to be proven is that any of the acts mentioned above, they should be done against her will. That is despite stiff resistance from the woman or without her consent. Now again, it should be a clear, unequivocal expression of her consent. Okay? It could be expressed, it could be implied, but the woman should be aware of the nature of the act and also the consequences that the act will entail. Only then can it be deemed to be a consent. Any consent given under a misconception of facts. What happened? There was a minor girl. Her music teacher raped her on the pretext of doing an operation on her so as to improve the quality of her voice. Now the minor girl was not aware of the nature of the act and the consequences that it would entail. So her consent would not be equivalent to a consent which is required to absolve an accused of his guilt. Third, with her consent, when her consent has been obtained by putting her or any person in whom she is interested in fear of death or of hurt. See what is required in law is free consent. So if the woman has been scared, if the woman has been pressurized, if she has been threatened so as to consent by putting either her in some sort of a danger or some other person in whom she is interested that unless you consent the other person would be harmed. So the consent given under that kind of a coercion is not to be deemed to be a consent. Fourth, with her consent, when the man knows that he is not her husband, and her consent is given because she believes that he is another man to whom she is or believes herself to be lawfully married. So this is when the woman is under the impression that maybe she is married to that man whereas actually she is not married to that man. So believing herself to be married to that woman, she cons to that man, she consents. Now this is not a proper consent or with her consent. When at the time of giving such consent, by reason of unsoundness of mind or intoxication or the administration by him personally or through another of any stupefying or unwholesome substance, she is unable to understand the nature and consequence of that to which she gives consent. Again a consent. So you see a person of unsound mind. When she consents, she is not aware of what she is consenting to because she is not aware of what the nature of her actions would be. Neither would a person who is under the influence of an intoxicating substance. See what is required if a woman is intoxicated and the intoxicating substance was administered to her either by the accused person or by some any other person anything which intoxicated her, which made her not to realize the nature and consequences of that to which she gives her consent and then if she gives her consent, it would not amount to a consent in the eyes of law. Next is with or without her consent when she is under 18 years of age. See the law has established age of consent for all minors at 18 years. In law relating to rape, any girl below the age of 18 years, whether married or unmarried, she is considered as incapable of giving her consent. So irrespective of her consent, the consent is deemed to be no consent in the eyes of law. There is an absolute bar on minors below 18 years to indulge in any kind of a sexual activity. 
So even if the act is done with the consent of a woman, but if she is below 16 or no, not 16, earlier it was 16, now it has been raised to 18 years. But if the woman is below 18 years of age, now this is known as statutory rape. Irrespective of the consent of the woman, what is needed to be proven is just that the woman was below 18 years of age and then it would amount to rape. And when she is unable to communicate, consent. Okay, when a woman, she is suppose comatose, she is suppose in such a medical condition or some other condition due to which she is not able to communicate consent and the accused takes advantage of the situation and forces himself on her, again this would not serve as a consent and there would be no defense available to the man against charges of rape. So, what we can see from section 63, there is a very broad range of activities which amount as sexual acts, but then what is required for those sexual acts to be termed as rape is that the act should be done under the circumstances that fall under any of these seven categories given under section 63. Coming to the explanations, explanation 1 for the purposes of this section vagina shall also include labia majora. Now why this explanation was required was because in cases of rape depth of penetration is immaterial. So this would be no defense to the accused to say that there was just a slight penetration or whatever depth of penetration is immaterial in cases of rape. Explanation 2. Consent means an unequivocal voluntary agreement when the woman by words, gestures or any form of verbal or non-verbal communication communicates willingness to participate in the specific sexual act provided that a woman who does not physically resist to the act of penetration shall not by the reason only of that fact be regarded as consenting to the sexual activity. So again this was been made very clear by the proviso that mere submission will not be regarded as consent. It is the burden of the accused, it is the burden on the defense to prove the presence of consent in cases of rape. And what is consent? As has been clarified under explanation 2, it must be an unequivocal voluntary agreement when the woman by words, gestures or any form of verbal or non-verbal communication she has to communicate willingness to participate in the specific sexual act. But then again, when it comes to the consent, concept of consent that has often been muddled with a lot of confusion. See the question that how is consent to be interpreted was discussed at length in the case of DPP versus Morgan. This is a 1975 judgment of House of Lords. In this case, the defendant invited other three defendants much younger men to his house and suggested that they have sex with his wife, telling them that she was kinky and any apparent resistance on her part would be a mere pretense. So the other three defendants believed what was told to them by the husband that yes, they were free to indulge with her and even if she put up a resistance, that would be a mere facade. Accordingly, they did have intercourse with her Despite her struggles and protests, she kept screaming until a hand was placed on her mouth. They were all subsequently charged with rape and the husband was charged for abetting and aiding rape. The wife deposed that she resisted and did not consent. At trial, the three men pleaded that they had honestly believed that Mrs. Morgan had consented to sexual intercourse because that is what they had been told by her husband. The trial judge directed the jury that the defendants would not be guilty of rape if they honestly believed that the woman was consenting and that belief in consent was reasonably held. But the jury nonetheless convicted all four and they appealed. In appeal, the House of Lords found that an honest mistaken belief in the victim's consent need not be reasonable to rebut a charge of rape. While the defendants won their legal argument, their convictions were upheld and the judges found that no reasonable jury would have ever acquitted the defendants even if they had been correctly directed by the trial judge as to the law. The accused were finally convicted, but two judges dissented and held 
that an honest and reasonable belief of the woman's consent would negative the mens rea because they held that they did not have the guilty intention to commit rape because they were under a reasonable and an honest impression that the woman had consented. So, what the court held, the two judges who dissented, they say, held that an honest and reasonable belief of the woman's consent would negative the mens rea and make the accused innocent. They further observed that when a defendant had sexual intercourse with a woman without her consent, genuinely believing nevertheless that she did consent, he was not to be convicted of rape. A man who has intercourse with a woman believing on inadequate grounds that she is consenting to it does not commit rape in ordinary parlance or in law. In rape, the prohibited act is intercourse without the consent of victim and the mental element lies in the intention to commit the act without caring whether the victim consents or not. A failure on part of prosecution to prove this element involves an acquittal because an essential element is lacking. Anyway, this was just a dissenting judgment and eventually these accused persons, they were convicted. Thus, according to law, presence of mens rea is established only by determining that the man was aware of the woman not consenting to the act. Where he reasonably believes that the woman consented, he lacks the mens rea required to constitute rape. The judges observed that the defendant must possess a reasonable belief to assert mistake of fact as negating the intent required for the crime. Now coming to the next clause. In cases where the woman consents because she believes the man to be her lawfully wedded husband such as where the man either conceals the fact of his being already married to some other woman from her and undergoes marriage ceremonies with her thereby making the woman believe that she is lawfully wedded to him or in cases where the man undergoes fake marriage ceremonies and dupes the woman into believing them to be correct or where the woman believes that he is some other man to whom she is lawfully wedded. The consent is no defense. In these cases, the woman agrees to cohabit with the man on the mistaken belief that she is lawfully wedded to him. Now, there are two exceptions also to the offense of rape. Exception one is a medical procedure or intervention shall not constitute rape. See, sometimes there, ha there are medical examinations which could be intrusive also in nature. So, where it is necessitated by circumstances, so such medical procedures or intrusions or interventions, they shall not constitute rape. Exception two. Sexual intercourse or sexual acts by a man with his own wife, the wife not being under 18 years of age is not rape. Now coming to exceptions. Exception 1. A medical procedure or intervention shall not constitute rape. So as per exception 1, a protection has been granted to medical personnel who might sometime have to conduct intrusive examinations also on a woman in order to determine various kinds of offenses that might have been committed against her body. In such cases, there has been a protection that has been given to medical personnel when they conduct such medical procedures or intervention. But the courts have repeatedly banned the two finger test. See, it is commonly seen that doctors, they conduct the PV examination, which is also known as the pervaginal examination or the two finger test on women to determine the laxity of vaginal muscles. Now, this is a test which has no legal, moral or scientific significance because what it determines is whether the, they try to determine by this whether the woman is habituated to sexual intercourse or not. Now, even if they determine this thing, now this has no bearing on the question of rape because rape is a question of law. So, even if the woman is habituated to sexual intercourse, what matters is in that particular case whether she had consented or not. If she had not consented, it would amount to rape. So, the relevance of that two finger test is nowhere to be seen and that is why what the courts have said that it is a double violation of a woman's anatomy to be subjected to such PV examination, especially where it does not serve any 
purpose and that would be extremely humiliating and derogatory to women that is why this test has been expressly banned. Now coming to exception 2, sexual intercourse or sexual acts by a man with his own wife, the wife not being under 18 years of age is not rape. So this age at which a wife had no agency to consent was initially 10 years okay, when IPC was drafted in the year 1860. So initially this age was 10 years. What happened that there was a case which is popularly known as the Pulmani case. In that case a girl who was 10 years 8 months of age was married. Now her husband who was a much older man 28 30 year old man and a man of healthy build he forced himself on her. He tried to establish his conjugal relations. The girl she was a minor. What happened? It resulted in a deep vaginal tear and the woman she kept bleeding continuously for 8 to 10 hours after which she succumbed to her injuries. During trial the courts held that the husband could not be held guilty of rape. Why? Because the age of full money was 10 years and 8 months whereas the law had pegged the age at 10 years. It was on the insistence of Fulmani's mother that finally the trial had to be held on the charges of grievous hurt and the husband could not be convicted on charges of rape but on charges of grievous hurt. Thereafter the legislators they raised the age of consent for minor wives at 12 then it was made 15 and finally in 2023 it was made 18. From 2013 to 2023 the age was 15 and between 15 to 18 years there was a window but then now finally it has been made 18 years of age. See exception 2 does not mean that a man cannot rape his wife. Rape is rape. Rape is basically a question of consent anything which is done to a woman against her consent. Okay. But then what IPC does is it grants exemption to husbands. Okay. So even if a man commits rape on his wife he will not be punished under the law because exception 2 has granted him an exemption from criminal liability provided the woman with whom he had sexual intercourse is his wife. Now activists, women groups they have been pleading for a long time so as to criminalize marital rape also but then there are counter arguments that see uh, how does a man know at what precise moment the woman has withdrawn her consent or when they are in a long term relationship some things they are taken for granted. Then there are people who say that maybe the woman she can take divorce from her husband because it would amount to mental cruelty then sexual violence has been accepted as a form of violence under the Domestic Violence Act and another argument is that it would be difficult to establish rape within marriage. There are so many other crimes also which are difficult to be proven. Does it mean that we will allow all those crimes to continue unabated? Does it mean that we will decriminalize all such crimes because there is a difficulty in proving those crimes? So there are many questions which surround this issue but then it is a very sensitive issue. There is a possibility of it being misused within the institution of marriage. If we criminalize marital rape, we will have to bring about reforms in our law relating to procedures, law relating to evidence. So as, a, as of now, this is a concept which is muddled in a lot of controversy. Earlier what the law said that if a woman is above 15 years of age, the man would not be held guilty of raping his wife. It would be when the woman was between 12 to 15 years of age then the man would be given a lesser punishment and it was only if the wife was below 12 years of age that the man would be held guilty of rape. Then we got the POXO in which we fixed the age of consent for every person whether married unmarried at 18. There was a uniform age at 18 years. The other hand we have the Child Marriage Prohibition Act which says that marriage between minors it cannot be solemnized. So what about the matrimonial rights or conjugal rights of the children who are married because Child Marriage Prohibition Act although it says that 
children's marriage it cannot be solemnized but in case the marriage is solemnized it continues to be a valid marriage till the time either of the party chooses to get it nullified by the courts so in such cases if the marriage is a valid marriage but under pox so you don't allow them the permission to consummate their marriage and then there are a lot of contradictions with the personal laws also because in muslim law what is the age of consent or the age of marriage is puberty so nowadays when girls they are attaining puberty as young as 9 or 10 years of age does that mean that we'll allow our such young daughters to get married so anyway keeping in view all these things our legislators they have now raised the age of consent for wives at 18 years now there is a uniformity between pocso and the bharatiya nyay sanhita and if a woman who is married is below 18 years of age and her husband tries to establish marital relations with her it would amount to rape irrespective of the status of parties to the marriage but if she is above 18 years of age there is no protection under the criminal law now moving to what is the punishment for rape prescribed under our laws section 64 of the bharatiya nyay sanhita says whoever except in the cases provided for in sub section 2 commits rape shall be punished with rigorous imprisonment of either description for a term which shall not be less than 10 years but which may extend to imprisonment for life and shall also be liable to fine section 64 clause 2 it says whoever being a police officer commits rape within the limits of the police station to which such police officer is appointed or in the premises of any station house or on a woman in such police officer's custody or in the custody of a police officer subordinate to such police officer or being a public servant commits rape on a woman in such public servant's custody or in the custody of a public servant subordinate to such public servant or being a member of the armed forces deployed in an area by the central government or a state government commits rape in such area or being on the management or on the staff of a jail remand home or other place of custody established by or under any law for the time being in force or of a women's or children's institution commits rape on any inmate of such jail remand home place or institution or being on the management or on the staff of a hospital commits rape on a woman in that hospital or being a relative guardian or teacher of or a person in a position of trust or authority towards the woman commits rape on such woman or commits rape during communal or sectarian violence or commits rape on a woman knowing her to be pregnant or commits rape on a woman incapable of giving consent or being in a position of control or dominance over a woman commits rape on such woman or commits rape on a woman suffering from mental or physical disability or while committing rape causes grievous bodily harm or maims or disfigures or endangers the life of a woman or commits rape repeatedly on the same woman shall be punished with rigorous imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than 10 years but which may extend to imprisonment for life which shall mean imprisonment for the remainder of that person's natural life and shall also be liable to fine so you now see minimum punishment has been prescribed and the legislators have further clarified that in case life imprisonment is given so life imprisonment shall mean the remainder of that person's natural life now there is no discretion with the courts to award a lesser sentence in case they want to award a life imprisonment life imprisonment would now not be construed to be 20 years or 14 years for the purpose of this subsection armed forces means the naval army and air forces and includes any member of the armed forces constituted under any law for the time being in force including the paramilitary forces and any auxiliary forces that are under the control of the central government or the state government hospital means the presence of the hospital and includes the presence of any institution for the reception and treatment of persons during convalescence or of persons requiring medical attention or 
rehabilitation. Police officer shall have the same meaning as assigned to the expression police under the Police Act of 1861. Women's or children's institution means an institution whether called an orphanage or a home for neglected women or children or a widow's home or an institution called by any other name which is established and maintained for the reception and care of women or children. So that was about punishment for rape. But then what about punishment for rape in certain uh, other cases? That is what section 65 deals with. It says, whoever commits rape on a woman under 16 years of age shall be punished with rigorous imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than 20 years. So you see there will be a rigorous imprisonment of minimum 20 years in case rape is committed on a girl who is below 16 years of age but which may extend to imprisonment for life which shall mean imprisonment for the remainder of that person's natural life and shall also be liable to fine provided that such fine shall be just and reasonable to meet the medical expenses and rehabilitation of the victim. Now, this is another progressive step that has been taken by our legislators now. Earlier, what would happen? Fine would be imposed on the accused and the fine would go to the state. But see, punishment to the accused does not translate into justice for the victim. So now, what has been done is that the fine that the accused is ordered to pay, sometimes that fine, a part of it may go to the state, a part of it might go towards the expenditure of the victim. And sometimes the court may direct the accused to pay the entire fine to the victim so as to help her in her rehabilitation and help her towards her medical treatment. Provided that any fine imposed under this subsection shall be paid to the victim. So now it has been made clear that fine which is paid to a rape victim shall go to the victim. Fine that is imposed in rape cases. Then, whoever commits rape on a woman under 12 years of age shall be punished with rigorous imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than 20 years, but which may extend to imprisonment for life, which shall mean imprisonment for the remainder of that person's natural life and with fine or with death. So, you see in case there is a girl who is below 12 years of age and in case she is subjected to rape then in such cases the courts have the discretion to award even death penalty to such a rapist provided that such fine shall be just and reasonable to meet the medical expenses and rehabilitation of the victim provided further that any fine imposed under this subsection shall be paid to the victim. <coughs> Section 66, it talks about punishment for causing death or resulting in persistent vegetative state of victim. What it says is, whoever commits an offence punishable under subsection 1 or subsection 2 of section 64 and in the course of such commission inflicts an injury which causes the death of the woman or causes the woman to be in a persistent vegetative state shall be punished with rigorous imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than 20 years but which may extend to imprisonment for life which shall mean imprisonment for the remainder of that person's natural life or with death. So you see in cases of brutal rapes now the courts have the discretion to award even death penalty. See the reason behind these amendments see for a long time people had been arguing that there has to be a provision that incorporates a more severe punishment for brutal rapes. And what was the reason? That was the case of Aruna Schoenbog. See, Aruna Ramchandra Schoenbog was a nurse working in KEM Hospital, Mumbai. On the evening of 27th November 1973, she was attacked by a sweeper in the hospital who wrapped a dog chain around her neck yanked her back with it. He tried to rape her but finding that she was menstruating he sodomized her. To mobilize, immobilize her during this act he twisted the chain around her neck. The next day a cleaner found her in an unconscious condition lying on the floor with blood all over. It was alleged that due to strangulation by dog chain the supply of oxygen to the brain stopped. The brain got damaged leaving her paralyzed. 
a police case was registered as a case of robbery and attempted murder because of the stigma associated with anal rape. Aruna was engaged to be married and the hospital administration wanted to save her impending marriage. This led to the accused's eventual conviction for robbery and attempted murder for which he underwent two concurrent sentences of seven years each and escaped the 10 years imprisonment that ha could have been awarded to him under section 377 of the IPC. Aruna died from pneumonia on 18th May 2015 after being in a persistent vegetative state for nearly 42 years. Now coming to section 67 which talks about sexual intercourse by husband upon his wife during separation. So, whoever has sexual intercourse with his own wife who is living separately whether under a decree of separation or otherwise without her consent shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which shall not be less than 2 years but which may extend to 7 years and shall also be liable to fine. In this section sexual intercourse shall mean any of the acts mentioned in clauses A to D of section 63. Now coming to sexual intercourse by a person in authority. So 68 says whoever being in a position of authority or in a fiduciary relationship or a public servant or superintendent or manager of a jail, remand home or other place of custody established by or under any law for the time being in force or a women's or children's institution or on the management of a hospital or being on the staff of a hospital abuses such position or fiduciary relationship to induce or seduce any woman either in his custody or under his charge or present in the premises to have sexual intercourse with him. Such sexual intercourse not amounting to the offence of rape shall be punished with rigorous imprisonment of either description for a term which shall not be less than 5 years but which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. Now why would such an act not amount to offence of rape? Because the accused would have induced the woman to consent. So once she has consented it would not amount to rape but it will still be punishable for an offence uh, for a punishment which shall not be less than 5 years and it may extend to 10 years. Again sexual intercourse would include any of the acts that are mentioned in clauses A to D of 63 and uh, all other things also they have further clarified what is a superintendent, who is a superintendent, what is the meaning of the expression hospital, women's, children's institution and so on. Now let us talk about section 69 which is a new addition to the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita. This is a provision which has been introduced in the year 2023. This is sexual intercourse by employing deceitful means. What it says is whoever by deceitful means or by making promise to marry to a woman without any intention of fulfilling the same. So what is important here is that at the time when the promise was made the accused should not have the intention of fulfilling the same and without the intention of fulfilling his promise of marriage the accused has sexual intercourse with her Sex, sexual intercourse not amounting to offence of rape. Why does not it amount to offence of rape? Because the woman has consented. Why has she consented? Because she believes that the man has promised to marry her. Shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which shall extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. Here deceitful means has been broadly defined and this includes inducement for or false promise of employment or promotion or marrying by suppressing identity. See we have got several judgments on this. The consent given by prosecutrix to sexual intercourse with the person with whom she is deeply in love on a promise that he would marry her on a later date cannot be said to be given under a misconception of fact. A false promise is not a fact within the meaning of the code. There is no straight jacket formula for determining whether consent given by the prosecutrix to sexual intercourse is voluntary or whether it is given under a misconception of fact. In the ultimate analysis, the tests laid down by courts provide at best guidance to the judicial mind while considering a question of consent. But the court must in each case consider the evidence before it and the surrounding circumstances before reaching a conclusion because each case has its own peculiar facts which may have a bearing on the question whether the consent was voluntary or was given under a misconception of fact. 
It must also weigh the evidence keeping in view the fact that the burden is on the prosecution to prove each and every ingredient of the offence, absence of consent being one of them. There are two judgments in, on this. In Yedla Srinivasa Rao versus State of AP, the intention of accused was right from the beginning not honest and he kept on promising that he will marry her till she became pregnant. This kind of consent obtained by accused cannot be said to be any consent because she was under a misconception of fact that the accused intends to marry her. Therefore, she had submitted to sexual intercourse with him. So, now this has been clarified under section 69 that is when the man has induced the woman with a false promise and this man has no intention of fulfilling his promise. See sometimes what happens at the time of making the promise the man had intention of fulfilling that promise but later on he could not keep his promise then that would not be covered under section 69 because what 69 talks about is a wrong intention at the time of making the promise. See in case of Jayanti Ram versus state of West Bengal it was observed that in order to come within meaning of misconception of fact the fact must have an immediate relevance. If a fully grown up girl consents to the act of sexual intercourse on a promise of marriage and continues to indulge in such activity until she becomes pregnant it is an act of promiscuity on her part and not an act induced by misconception of fact. Now all said and done let us not go into whether the judgment is correct or incorrect, but look at the kind of language which our judges choose to use, act of promiscuity on her part. They do not want to comment on the acts that have been done by the male counterpart. In such cases, what the court says, the determining factor is the intention of accused at the time of act. If he did not intend to marry, then he is guilty of cheating. Therefore, it depends on case to case and the evidence led in the matter. Section 670 talks about gang rape. Then we have got a couple of other provisions. But this will be all for this lesson, the issue of gang rape and further uh, provisions relating to the offense of uh, rape will be taken in our upcoming lesson which would be titled as sexual offences part 2 wherein in addition to the remaining provisions of rape we will also be talking about other sexual offences against women such as disrobing, voyeurism, sexual harassment, eve teasing, molestation and so on. So this will be all for this lesson. See you very soon when we meet for lesson number 10. Thank you.